Welcome to Rutgers Center for Chinese Studies, uh, otherwise known as RCCS. Um, please visit our website, rccs.rutgers.edu for all of the upcoming events. We have events pretty much uh, every week throughout the semester. You can also follow us on Facebook uh, at facebook.com slash Rutgers CCS. Uh, so today's talk is also co-sponsored by Rutgers Global China Office. So we thank them for their support, make, which makes this possible. Uh, I'm very delighted to introduce Dr. Yao Ling to, as our guest speaker today. So Dr. Yao Ling received his PhD in political theory from Columbia in 2016, and he taught in Hong Kong and mainland China subsequently. His research area includes contemporary liberal and democratic theories, feminism, constitutional law, Chinese politics and society, and comparative institutions. Right now, he is a JD candidate at Yale Law School. So the title for today's talk, based upon his recent rather provocative article with the same title, it's called Beaconism and the Trumpian Metamorphosis of Chinese Liberal Intellectuals. Um, Yao Lin, take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Zhang, for inviting me to give this talk. And thank, uh, I thank uh, Rutgers uh, Center for Chinese Studies for organizing the, uh, the talk. And thanks, everyone, for coming uh, in this snowy day. <laughs> so my talk, um, as Professor Zhang has mentioned, is based on uh, a paper I recently published in the Journal of, uh, of Contemporary China. But uh, I think I will incorporate some uh, like current events that occurred uh, in the wake of the publication of, of this paper. So I'll, be, I'll start with some backgrounds of like why I wrote, wrote this paper and how the idea like the whole thing started. So in 2015, when Trump announced his uh, bid for presidency, uh, I observed that uh, there was an immediate, immediate wake of enthusiasm among like my Chinese liberal colleagues. Right? They, they, they published a lot of posts on which are uh, groups and which are moments um, fantasizing how great Trump would be as a president and uh, and like uh, uh, internalizing all those talking points by Trump about like anti-political correctness, about uh, how corrupt the establishment is and about like how to uh, we need to make America great again and so on and so forth. At the beginning, I didn't pay close attention to that, but uh, very soon, I realized that that was a real phenomenon, right? So, but at the time, uh, this phenomenon was kind of neglected by uh, Western media, international media. So uh, in 2016, when uh, Business Insider, an um, American uh, online news outlet, uh, asked me for an interview uh, about like rise of Trump, um, Trump mania in China, uh, so I tried to Told them about, uh, tell them about this this liberal Trump fandom, uh, but uh, but but the published interview by them omitted the entire part of this liberal like liberal side of a story of Trump fandom, and they published uh, the interview with me about uh, 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 of uh, where I talk about why some non-liberals, some Chinese nationalists, also fantasize Trump. So this is a complicated uh, phenomenon. So I, I think in 2016 and 2017, there, ha there had already been a, a, a series of news reports by New York Times, by The Atlantic, and so on and forth uh, on the nationalist Trump fandom in China. And uh, I agree with their analysis that uh, nationalists in China have good reasons to to um, and to praise Trump, uh, some of them see Trump as weak, so they see that a Trump uh, they saw that a Trump presidency would be an opportunity for China, right? And others uh, like Trump's ide uh, uh, Trump's ideology, Trump's nationalistic right wing rhetoric, uh, which they think is in line with uh, the propaganda for the China model. The kind of authoritarian nationalism. So, so it's it's um, intuitive that 
some Chinese nationalists who be into Trump and into Trumpism. But it would be a puzzle, right, for those who are self-proclaimed -pro liberal Democrats, uh, those who applaud uh, human rights and universal values uh, to become Trump fans. <clears throat> so I think that was part of the reason when I uh, was interviewed by American news media in 2016, nobody really believed me that a Trump, uh, Chinese liberal intellectuals were into Trump. Like they, they think that's just not possible. That's just kind of intuitive. I, I, am, I, am I making things up, right? But after the election, uh, you, like if you have some experience with, with experience with uh, with the Chinese social media, you realize that you realize that a uh, Chinese uh, liberal Trump fandom not on, not only did not subside, but but like it become more of a phenomenon. It become larger, right? So uh, liberals, prominent liberal intellectuals like Guo Yuhua, Gao Quanxi, Sun Liping, uh, sociology uh, sociology professors, political science professors, law professors. They all wrote things applauding Trump and applauding Trump's domestic policies in particular, like how he's curbing uh, affirmative actions, how he's combating political correctness, how he's like reasserting the kind of white Christian ideology of the United States and so on and so forth, right? So then some people started to got interest in this phenomenon and, and uh, uh, competing explanations started to, to pop up. But uh, those explanations were unsatisfied, in my opinion. Like the, the two uh, primary explanations circulating at the time before the publication of my paper were first that, uh, oh, those Chinese liberal intellectuals uh, were just being tactical, right? They, they praised Trump because they believed that uh, because at the time Trump was saying that I, I, I'm going to wait, I'm going to wage a trade war against China, right? So those liberal Chinese intellectuals who were kind of anti-regime, who were pro-reform, were kind of uh, wishfully thinking that uh, maybe Trump's trade war will have a kind of nudging effect on China, right? Pushing Xi Jinping towards uh, the greater opening, greater degree of reform, and so on and forth. So they kind of formed an imaginary temporary alliance with Trump, despite their disagreement with Trump's domestic policies and uh, international policies. But I argue that that was not actually not the fact, right? So if you read what those uh, Chinese liberal intellectuals wrote and said, you, you find out that they, they're really enthusiastic about Trump and the the things they focus on, the, 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 the things they, they put so much energy to, to promulgating, to, to, to praising are uh, Trump's uh, deeds and talks that are unrelated to China, right? So in my paper, I gave a bunch of examples of how they loaded Trump's, uh, Trump's like so-called uh, great uh, reform and opening that in the in the history of humankind that only Deng Xiaoping's reform and opening could, could be compared with and things like that. Right? So they are really, really into Trump's policies and they really internalize Trump's talking points. Right? And another explanation uh, was that, oh, those Chinese liberal intellectuals, they're not really Chinese, in, uh, they're not really liberal. Like uh, the, the the idea is that well, the term liberal or liberalism uh, has, is ambiguous, right? So you have to understand like uh, its meaning in the local context, right? So Chinese liberals they are just neoliberals, they are right wingers. They just oppose the they, they just happen to oppose the regime. Uh, what they like uh, their ideologies are always this kind of a uh, Reagan. Uh, Reagan uh, such a, you know, this kind of eight, uh, 1980s neo neoliberal ideologies. So it's no wonder that uh, they, 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 they feel like affiliated with Trump at this point. Um, so I think this explanation has some truth in it, but not, uh, not full truth. And it's unsatisfactory in any case. But why is that? First of all, if we look closely uh, to the, the, the ideological uh, uh, the, the diversities among those 
upon fantasizing Chinese liberals, you, you can find out that uh, not every one of them, in fact, a substantial proportion of them uh, uh, cannot be easily categorized uh, as neoliberal. Right? So for example, Professor Guo Yuhua, uh, a prominent sociology professor at Tsinghua University, has been an advocate for workers' rights, for minimum wage, right, for labor union, and so on and so forth for decades. She, like, if you look into a vacation record and speech record and so on and so forth, you realize that she retains a lot of this kind of sociologist left wing um, ideological components and she, she, she just repudiated a lot of common uh, neoliberal talking points. And also, not only among like uh, liberals who, who vocally oppose the regime, but also uh, among some neo leftist, neo left intellectuals who, <clears throat> such as like Wang Hui and Cui Ziyuan, uh, uh, the, uh, who who uh, explicitly repudiate uh, neoliberalism, uh, neo uh, neoliberalism, uh, in 2016, around the time of 2016, and some of them even nowadays to to this day are also Trump fans, and they they they, they fantasize and they support many of the the Trump's uh, policies, immigration policy and race policy, and and so on and so forth. So. Uh, <clears throat> The neoliberal account, the neoliberal affinity explanation, as I call it, does not explain the full uh, picture. And also, it is unsatisfactory because it doesn't go to the roots of the problem. Like, so even if the majority of liberal uh, Chinese Trump fans, Trump, uh, uh, Trump fans are neoliberal to some extent, we need to ask like, why they subscribe to neoliberal Ideologies in the first place, a prompt them to doing so, right? And also, uh, for those neoliberal Chinese uh, liberal, uh, what well, this is long <laughs> description, neoliberal Chinese uh, Trump idolizing liberal intellectuals, right? Uh, <clears throat> what makes the transition from their initial subscription subscription to neoliberalism uh, to uh, an idolization of Trump uh, in recent years. And so we need to find out, we need to, we need to identify the causal mechanisms underlying that transition, underlying that metamorphosis. And so comparing China for, uh, with some other uh, Western or Global South countries that have uh, kind of electoral democracy, uh, we can see there's a, there's a deep contrast there, like in, in, in uh, countries where there are electoral democracies, uh, libertarian neo neoliberal politicians uh, have to appease to, to the electorate in order to win uh, primary elections or general elections. Right? So they have a motivation, have a motivation as long as they they they, they build they have built a, a, a electorate alliance with conservative or with uh, populist uh, electorate uh, voters, they have a motivation to win over them. So they have to appease to those voters. Right? So we can see that in, in US, US, for example, in the, in the Republican party, some, some self-proclaimed libertarian uh, 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 politicians uh, have in recent years in the Trump era moved to, move, uh, to Trumpism. Right, because they have this underlying like electoral considerations. For Chinese liberal intellectuals, there's no such consideration. There's no such mechanism. So we to we need to find out like what's the actual mechanism uh, underlying that that transition here. Right. So in my paper, I argue that uh, what well, we need to look into uh, the kind of uh, political psychology underlying Chinese or um, mainstream Chinese liberalism, which I argue is beaconism. So what is beaconism? I think that it, there are two components there, one political and one civilizational. The political beaconism is the kind of uh, uh, lived experience and, and, and projection that stem out of, uh, out of the history of Maoist totalitarianism. Right? So liberal intellectuals in China uh, have lived through that era and 
or they have learned about the error in, in, in school and in, in textbooks, in retelling in, uh, of, of those horrible stories, right? So that their visions, their political visions, political imaginations, and their perceptions of, the, of politics uh, is always filtered through this lived experience or, or, or recollections, right? So, so when they uh, try to understand what's going on in the world, what's going on in the United States, what's going on in the uh, Western Europe, the most convenient way for them is to use the kind of vocabulary they were most uh, uh, comfortable with, they're most familiar with, and, and, and uh, situate uh, the current events overseas in, in the possessed vocabulary, right? So, that's why you can see um, when, uh, for example, in recent years, when in the United States, there's a conversation about whether, whether or not we should remove uh, Confederacy statues, Chinese liberal intellectuals, the first, the first response of them was like, oh, is that cultural revolution, right? Is that uh, the, the, those who advocate for removing Confederacy statues, are they red guards? Right? So that's the way like they restructured uh, political events. They restructured uh, like uh, political process and political vocabularies into their lived experience. Right? So uh, that, that is also why, part of the reason why in the reform and opening uh, era in 1980s, 1990s, uh, they, many of them were so receptive to neoliberal ideologies because for them it's just it it just makes sense right it's like oh we just came out of the era of pan pan economy which was a disaster and of course free market is great right so that those those things just look natural for them right so so they have this uh lived experience they have this uh uh, uh vocabulary and so they, they structure uh, what uh, current events uh, in this framework. And uh, <clears throat> with this framework, they start to understand or misunderstand what's going on in the world, what's going on in the United States, what's going on in Europe. Uh, so now they will, they will, they will, they will, they will understand the, 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 the discourse about political correctness as a uh, as a kind of uh, uh, cultural revolution style discourse about whether or not you should pledge loyalty to a cause, uh, whether or not you should self-censor, whether or not you should like, uh, things can be freely said. And uh, th th they will understand like uh, affirmative actions and all those uh, uh, restorative justice uh, initiatives as the kind of micromanagement of a society. Which they abhor, right? So, 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 so. Uh, over time, they have uh, they formed in 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 the early twenty first century. They have already formed this uh, disposition of perceiving uh, the the political discourse, political di uh, division in the United States and in Europe, as a kind of uh, pro and anti cultural re uh, revolution, pro and anti Maoism, right? Struggle. And they grew. They they have grow, uh, grown dissatisfied with uh, American liberals and progressives and uh, leftists of uh, 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 allegedly purporting to return or to to turn America into a totalitarian state. Right. And uh, because of this uh, predisposed uh, dis uh, dis uh, misunderstanding and dissatisfaction, satisfaction, uh, they, when they see that some political figure uh, arises who repudiates all those things they abhor, right? They feel a, a strong urge to identify with them. And, and uh, so uh, this, this is, bec uh, <clears throat> I'll put it, put it this way, like, uh, so they, 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 here's how the idea of beaconism comes in. Right, so because uh, through their lived experience and because of the need to advocate uh, liberal democracy in the context of China, 
they have to find, or they think they have to find a sharp contrast with China in the real world, which presumably the United States, right? And they, because they use the, the United States, the real world United States as a reference uh, point for the sake of criti criticizing the Chinese regime, they unintentionally internalize a sanitized image of the United States, of, of American politics, uh, as the beacon of the light, right? So when, when American liberals and leftists self-criticize, uh, when they say that, oh, the U US has always had the, the problem of systematic racism, uh, Chinese liberal intellectual, intellectual, uh, intellectuals recall the idea, right? So this kind of self-criticism undermines the image of the beacon. And could potentially be used as a, as a, a propaganda tool for the, the Communist Party of China. Right? Because the Communist Party of China has also, in, in fact, uh, used the kind of rhetoric, right? They, they, when when uh, Western countries criticize China for its uh, failed human rights records, uh, the Chinese government responded with uh, human rights white papers criticizing America for, for racial tension and so on and so forth, right? So in this, um, in this uh, 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 discursive war, we can say, uh, the Chinese liberal intellectuals, they, they really wanted to hold on to an image, a purified image uh, of beacon, of beacon of light. And when, and when this, uh, this internal self-criticism from the left shattered the foundation of this image. They 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 uh they see this as a threat to their uh, self-identified project of making China better, right? And especially in the Xi Jinping era, in the Xi Jinping era when Xi Jinping consolidated his power and 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 uh and tightened the control of the society, Chinese liberal intellectuals feel kind of exact existential threat. And, and this, uh, this existential threat reinforces their biggest uh, political psychology and reinforces their identification and idolization with, with Trump, right? So this is the political part of Deaconism. But I think that's not the full story. I think there's a darker story, a parallel darker story, which is civilizational Deaconism. So, uh, but here we, of course, we need to acknowledge the internal diversity within Chinese liberal intellectuals. Some Chinese liberals are maybe more political beaconists than civilization beaconists, but others are the other way around. But uh, just put, uh, to put things on the table, I think a civilizational beaconism is, has, a, has, a, has a root in China's so-called history of 100 years of humiliation, starting from late Qing. When late Qing Dynasty, when China started to uh, interact with the Western world and was humiliated, defeated and humiliated by the Western world, uh, which had uh, a more advanced uh, techno uh, technology and science and so, and so on and so forth. Right? And since then, Chinese intellectuals have uh, have been trying to find ways to 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 revitalize China as a nation, to save the, the Chinese nation, right? And the first thing they grabbed were the dominant ideologies at the, uh, uh, in the West at the time. Unfortunately, at the time, the West, the dominant ideology in the West at the time is kind of nascent uh, scientific racism, right? social Darwinism, and, uh, uh, and colonialism, and so on and so forth. So if you, if you, if you look at uh, the writings of Chinese intellectuals from then to now, from as early as Han Yu Wei and Liang Qitao, you see, you can find, you can see that they, they kind of internalize many of the uh, scientific racist talking points. Liang Qitao, in his one of his famous uh, article, Ruan Zhong Guo Zhi Jiang Qiang on the inevitable rise of China, uh, talk about how um, the white people are the greatest people and the black and brown people are the lowest. Uh, and the yellow people, meaning Chinese, uh, like even though white people think uh, yellow people are lower, but we are actually like as 
as great as white people because of this kind of uh, brain structure, because you, know, you can see this and that, and Japan was the evidence and so on forth. This kind of a narrative has been inherited uh, across generations and exacerbated by the fact that during the Maoist era, uh, the disciplines of social sciences and humanities was uh, almost destroyed. Right? So uh, in the reform and opening era, when uh, Chinese intellectuals and scholars re-encountered uh, Reagan Satirite uh, ideologies, which blends uh, libertarianism, conservatism, and kind of uh, uh, scientific racism-based words, uh, uh, hierarchy, uh, they, they found affinity there. And uh, they, they, become, they, to this day, many of them are quite comfortable with the Trumpian talking points of how Muslims are coming to destroy uh, white Western civilization, uh, how black people are not you know, up to the task of, of civilizing and so on and so forth. Uh, for example, and, and Liu Yu and, and many of the prominent Chinese liberal intellectuals have, uh, as I cited in my, in my article, in my paper, have uh, from time to time expressed those views those civilizational views in their writings, right? And uh, those, well, so, so that's part of the reason why some Chinese liberal intellectuals, uh, as I've said, are comfortable uh, from the beginning with Trump's uh, racist and, and nationalist uh, uh, discourses. Uh, but I need to add that that's, I wasn't like blaming all this on Chinese liberalism. I think the kind of civilizational mechanism has its counterpart, has its parallels in Chinese nationalism as well, which I call civilizational vindic vindicationism. Uh, this uh, Chinese nationalism also has the roots in this in in that history of hundred years of humiliation, and even though they they took a different road. I saw China, uh, civilizational beaconist uh, internalizing kind of scientific racism and, and white supremacy, uh, supremacy in late 19th centuries, look up to Western civilizations as the beacon of light, as the civilization beacon of light. And that dream is that uh, the, Chi the Chinese civilization could be improved to the point that they can join the hand Hand to hand with uh, Western civilizations and become uh, co-hegemons of the world, right? And Chinese nationalists, they also acknowledge or they believe that at the current point, uh, Western civilization is the greatest civilization, but the Chinese civilization had the glorious history and we need to return to our glory. And what should we do by defeating defeating the, the current hegemon and become the new hegemon, right? So the Chinese nationalists and Chinese liberals have one thing in common that is they, they subscribe to the, the view that there's a civilizational he, uh, hierarchy in the world. And uh, the top, on the top of the hierarchy is, is the West. And whether or not China was uh, surpass them is a point of debate, but they, Agree that other cultural groups, other ethnicities, other religious groups are at the uh, lower part of the hierarchy. So, like Muslims, uh, black and brown people. Uh, so, the Chinese nationalists, uh, would, even though they see the West as a, as an as a potential enemy, they they think uh, they also think that believe that the West is a worthy adversary. Right? And they, they agree just, just like those, those who subscribe to Beaconist views. Those Chinese nationalists all agree with Trumpists that oh, we, should, uh, we should kick away immigrants, we should kick away, uh, kick away refugees, we, we should kick away Muslims because, uh, because, uh, because they contaminate Western civilization. 
can make Western civilization an unworthy adversary with uh, against Chinese civilization. But so, uh, but but of course, the the actual discourse is actual based on the Chinese internet is a bit more complicated than that. But I I'm, I was trying to draw a, a, a like like kind of generalized contour, or generalized uh, picture of of uh, of the kind of mental gym gymnastics, both on the side of Chinese liberals and on the side of Chinese non-liberals, and and present this, this kind of uh, explanation of why, uh, as we can see, both liberals and non-liberals, or at least a substantial uh, part of both camps, have become Trump fans in recent years. And up to this point, actually, um, I don't know if you noticed that, like uh, in in the past few weeks, there are reports on how uh, some of the Chinese uh, dissident networks have been actively manufacturing uh, fake damning stories about Joe Biden, about Hunter Biden, right? Uh, the Epoch Times, which is a uh, part of the Falun Gong network, and Apple Daily, uh, Apple Daily, which is a, a Hong Kong based dissident newspaper. Uh, have been involved in ma manufacturing stories about Joe Biden, about about Hunter Biden. So, uh, <clears throat> to some some latecomers about uh, 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 on this trend, they they find it puzzled. Like, why why did Apple Daily do that? But but if you uh, if you look into like underlying political psychology, the underlying mechanism, uh, mechanism. You, you can see that there has always been this trend. There has always been this all those those years of preparation, uh, which led up to this point. So I think uh, that, that my paper is not only often an explanation of a phenomenon, but like it's kind of an engagement with current events and engagement, and also uh, a privilege, like first step about like uh, first step towards. Uh, developing st uh, uh, strategies uh, to to counter the, this kind of uh, this kind of uh, uh, political psychology, which will have ripple effect in the real world. Okay, so, I think that's my uh, uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Um, so yes, thank you very much. This is very this is very interesting. Um, since um, our audience is intimate enough, uh, feel free to unmute yourself to, uh, to ask questions. Um, so you can feel free to, to do it on your own. So uh, I see Ari. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, this is such a fascinating topic uh, and something uh, that's interesting to me in part because I don't feel that I'm really invested in it very much. Uh, so just a couple of quick things. I mean, you're talking about uh, civilizational beaconism. I guess I might say, use a term like cultural idealization, perhaps, which uh, uh, is simpler terms. And uh, as you've said, I mean, this is something that goes back a hundred and more years uh, with Chinese intellectuals. Um, and it continues till today. I mean, uh, you know, the the uh, dominance of say Western literary theory in China is another example where where Chinese literary critics are. You know, how can, can't we get the the yoke of uh, Western literary theory off our backs? We have no. We're not even using indigenous forms of. So that, again, there's an idealization of the West and an adoption of Western ideas. Now, I just want to quickly go to uh, the issue of race. Uh, when I was, I remember back in 2016, and this is not directly related, but perhaps somewhat, uh, 2016, it wasn't uh, WhatsApp. There was an app before WhatsApp that was more commonly used, I think. Anyway, there was, a, there was an, an app in a, I had a Chinese friend and we would read uh, some of the dialogue and there was a lot of support for Trump in the Chinese American community and the Chi and the Chinese in the United States uh, support for Trump. And I was kind of shocked. I was like, kind of, what is this about? 
Uh, and uh, to oversimplify, I, it seemed to me that in part it had to do with uh, a, a bitterness uh, against uh, primarily African Americans and uh, ideas of affirmative action and a feeling that uh, Asians were getting the shorts, uh, short end of the stick uh, and, and that kind of thing. And this is something you've brought up again uh, with the liberal, with the intellectuals you're talking about, that there's an underlying kind of racial component and the social Darwinistic kind of thinking. Um, so anyway, I mean, uh, my, again, my initial, uh, free, my initial association is going back to 2016, where I saw the support online in the United States for Trump in the Chinese American community. Uh, and to me, it was all very counterintuitive, frankly. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for bringing up, bringing up this, uh, this point, Barry. Uh, I think, uh, as you said, there's a there's a strong racial component here, in especially uh, in among, among Chinese American Trump supporters. I think uh, so. You know what I said about Chinese liberal intellectuals uh, applied to a large extent to Chinese American Trump supporters. And there's a slight slight difference here. That is, Chinese Americans living in the United States, they have a like a firsthand experience with affirmative actions, and they ha they have a kind of different lived experience. Uh, especially the, the first, many of the first generation uh, Chinese American immigrants migrate here to the kind of higher education opportunities and high wage work opportunities, right? So they, met, some of them struggle through uh, the, the, the whole system, uh, the so-called meritocratic system, and they believe that they deserve to get rewarded and their kids deserve to get rewarded. And when they find out that, uh, uh, that the kids uh, are not included in a film direction program, so I don't know, like, but they, they feel infuriated, right? And so, so that uh, also, as a, uh, I think, a uh, political scientist, uh, Jean, uh, uh, Korean American political scientist, Jean Claire uh, Kim, had a, had a paper on so called racial triangulation of Asian Americans. Uh, that the idea that the, the mainstream white uh, culture, white media, has always used this uh, the, the uh, discourses to pit uh, blacks and Asian Americans against each other. Uh, blacks uh, they, they they characterize uh, blacks as lazy uh, and praise uh, Asian Americans as model minorities to 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 uh, shade the blacks right as, as lazy. But they also characterize uh, characterize blacks as as civil rights fighters. To shade Asian Americans as perpetual foreigners, and so uh, it it is easy, very easy for Chinese Americans, especially first generation Chinese Americans who are who are not familiar with uh, the history of civil rights struggles, uh, the all kinds of political process, political intricacies in the United States, to fall prey to this uh, rhetorical rhetorical trap, right? and they feed back those informations to WeChat, to those who are in China. But they, they and they form a giant echo chamber uh, across the, the Pacific Ocean. Right? So the Chinese liberal intellectuals legitimize legitimize uh, Trump talk, talk points through liberal democratic uh, uh, term uh, uh, vocabulary, and Chinese Americans uh, substantiate those talking points through their anecdotal lived experience and total stories about how they were discriminated and, and assaulted by blacks and so, so on and forth in the United States. And so they reinforce uh, each other's, reinforce each other's like Trumpism in this way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Steve and Karsten after. Okay, great, thank you. This is, this is really fascinating. And uh, for me, one of the things it does is I think it helps me to understand when I, I was in uh, China in the spring of 2017, I had a, a, a series of conversations with uh, sort of various, various uh, Chinese Confucians um, uh, about uh, on, on, on a bunch of different topics where I was attempting to defend 
what I call progressive Confucianism. Um, uh, and they were articulating various other kinds of Confucianism, left-wing Confucianism, liberal Confucianism, uh, so on and so forth. Um, and I would be repeatedly labeled as Baizu. Um And I think I now have a better understanding of what was going on there um, uh, because uh, certainly my, I don't know, I don't know that, that my sort of US domestic political affiliations were ever, ever explicitly discussed, um, uh, but the sorts of uh, sort of progressivism uh, uh, that I'm attempting to affiliate Confucianism with in certain ways, right? That is obviously the opposite of what the, these beaconists wanna support. Um, uh, so I'm trying to decide whether I think there's a tension between the political side and the civilizational side sometimes, but um, I guess as long as, cause you know, some of these Confucians are very clearly uh, civilizationalists um, uh, where you're right, there's a hierarchy, but it's not the Western uh, one on top. It's the, um, uh, it's the Chinese civilization. So none of that is exactly a question. Um, uh, but if I, if I did have a question, I think it might be, uh, what about the distinction between uh, West, sort of the, the West and the modern? Um, that, that always strikes me as a, a really important distinction to try to keep it clearly in mind, um, uh, which is often conf conflated, right? To modernize, you Westernize. Um, uh, and uh, I think that if we, if we think about how to push back maybe uh, against some of this, that distinction can be very useful. Um, but at any rate, uh, thank you so much for, for a really fascinating set of remarks. Thank you, thank you, Stephen. I think that's a very good question, like how to distinguish Western from modernized. And that's an ongoing project. Like uh, I think every, every scholar, every academic need to reflect on, right? It's not only in China, in Chinese discourse, but in Western discourse as well, Chinese uh, West, Western academia need to and are engaging in this kind of reflection. Uh, even, uh, I think some younger Chinese scholars have been doing that, have been thinking about that, even though like the general discourses, public discourses and scholarly discourses are, uh, in China have unfortunately lacking this uh, in this respect, uh, I think. And uh, also like, I want to go back to what you mentioned, like the anecdote that you have been labeled by Zhu, right? Because I, I just saw uh, a, a question in the chat box from Joyce uh, that uh, the, how, how did the, the, the term by Zhu ar arise as a derogatory term? Um, I, I think that's a, a fascinating, fascinating topic. I touch upon this in my paper a little bit, but I also recommend uh, uh, my friend uh, Chen Chen Zhang, uh, Zhang Chen Chen, like I don't know how you pronounce it, uh, Chen Chen's uh, paper on the, the, the curious rise of the term Baizu in Chinese uh, on, in Chinese internet. I think that that's the title. Anyway, like 2017 paper. Uh, <clears throat> so in, in my opinion, like Baizu uh, functions, that there are two functions of, of the term Baizu. First of all, as you can see, like it's derogatory, right? So it denotes the kind of idealistic, naive, uh, uh, sac uh, 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 sacrimonious, right? Uh, the the, the uh, visionary who talks social justice, but pays no attention to local conditions, right? And who like welcomes refugees, but was but, uh, but would be later murdered or raped by refugees. Also, mm -hmm. there, there are a lot of mis this kind of stories running <laughs> amok on, uh, on Chinese internet, right? And the, the Chinese Chinese uh, uh, netizens and Chinese liberal intellectuals have been using the term to 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 uh, like I, I think some in in a way akin to uh, what the term social justice warriors are used in the United States, even though Baizu has a much more stronger Derogatory uh, connotation, and the second function of Baizu, I think, is to emphasize the by the whiteness, right? So, as you can see, even when Chinese intellectuals and netizens pick uh, an epithet, pick a derogatory term, they construct 
the term in a way that has a wide centeredness, right? So, so the, the, the underlying connotation of this term is that, well, even though Baizu is naive and idealistic and knows nothing, you know, but still they are the people who have moral agency. They have moral like courage, they, they speak out. But uh, those, there, there's no hate war in the world. There's no hurt war in the world, right? That, that, so, so all those social justice initiatives are fought by Baizu, like according to Chinese medicine. Uh, and, and, and blacks, black people, brown people, they, they become invisible in this narrative, right? Even in, in the process of being labeled, they become in, invisible. But so, so I think uh, unintentionally, this label reveals a very strong uh, Western-centered, white-centered uh, uh, ideology of Chinese, narr uh, Chinese discourse in general, currently. Okay, Carson, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm somewhat puzzled about Chinese nationalism among liberals. Let me, let me put it in a particular context. Um, during, during Perestroika and some of the challenges to the Soviet empire in 1989, and then in Russia, there was a strong nationalist opposition to the regime. But the nationalist opposition was to the regime of Soviet communism. And it took the form of, we want to go back to the old czarist ideas. But I, I can't assume that something like that is going on in China. I assume that Chinese liberals perceive the regime as very nationalistic. So if they too are nationalistic, how do they distinguish their nationalism from the nationalism of the regime. That's, and I have one other question, it's just very brief, which is how does the whole set of ecological issues factor in? Um, because there's, I'm sure they see that there's lots of pro ecological issues in China. They see Trump as very anti-science on ecology. Uh, how, does, how does that, how do they process that? In the in being pro Trump. Thank you, thank you, Carsten, for the for the questions. I, as to the first question, uh, <clears throat> I think uh, maybe like I I wasn't like clear in, in my presentation. I think uh, I was trying to make a difference between Chinese liberals and Chinese national nationalists. Uh, so I think there are uh, liberal nationalists in China uh, nowadays. Uh, they. But their nationalism is a kind of uh, watered down version. They, uh, and also a, um, to some extent, a strategic response to the rise of nationalism in recent decades. Uh, so some Chinese nationalists uh, was trying to, um, you know, envision a kind of uh, uh, political theoretical stance that can, you know, um, incorporate as many supporters as possible like uh, in the kind of uh, liberal project. But, but I don't think you were talking about those liberals. I think, uh, so uh, in, among Trump, Trump supporters, I try to distinguish between liberal supporters and nationalist supporters. And I think that they, they have a commonality in, in subscribing to the kind of civilizational talk points, right? But uh, nationalists, they are, uh, they see the mission of the Chinese nation as uh, rising to the top of the civilizational hierarchy and replacing uh, the, 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 the West. Right? So, so in my paper, I gave an example of Jiang Shigong, who is a Peking University professor and also uh, the, 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 the brain behind uh, Xi Jinping's uh, Hong Kong policy. Uh, so he, in 2019, uh, published a, a paper on uh, continents versus the oceans and he was like uh, he what he said was like uh, in the history there was always struggles between continents and nations and uh, con uh, Oceania countries like the, U the US or UK have been winning and winning they defeated France they defeated Germany they defeated Soviet Union and the continental force has been retreating from the west to the east of the Eurasian continent and now it's China 
uh, at last, China needs to stand up and reclaim the, the, the glory of the whole continental world and things like that. And we, we can do that because we have this, that, that uh, civilizational heritage and so on and so forth. Right? And he is a supporter of Trump because he thinks that there's a lot of commonalities between what he envisions the world, uh, what the world order needs to be, should be, and what Trump envisions it. Right, so, uh, but but you can see that their uh, rationale for supporting Trump is very different from uh, the liberal rationale for supporting Trump. So the liberal intellectuals, they they some of them uh, try to articulate an, a more nationalist uh, uh, stance, but but uh, this is something um, you know not closely related to their support of Trump. I hope that that addresses your question. Does that I, mean that the, the nationalists then would not, the nationalists as opposed to the liberals who are, they have some nationalist elements, would not necessarily be in opposition to the regime the way you're describing it. Because the regime is nationalist, exactly, I assume, essentially in that way. But then the question is the liberals if they're also nationalists, and let's just say the liberals who are in opposition to the regime, to the degree that their positive view of Trump is also nationalist, that, that's where it confuses me. Because I understand why the nationalists supporting China would say, okay, they like Trump, he's, he's gonna bu help build a new world order in which China nationalism will thrive. But the liberals who are opposing the regime uh, I don't quite understand how that, their nationalism fits in since they would be opposing a nationalist regime. That, that's, the, that's the thrust of my question. All right, so uh, yeah, I, I don't have a good answer to that question. I, mean, I, I think that's uh, maybe because the, the sample is it's more like uh, this like a Jap, Jap, Jap talk thing, like uh, all those positions uh, that you find like those who subscribe to a uh, liberal nationalist uh, and pro-Trump uh, stance might be like uh, a small percentage of the of uh, the, the intellectual circle. So I think I need to look more closely to them uh, into them like and see how their mental gym, uh, gymnastics works because I think there's always a lot of mental gym, gymnastics involved uh, to, to reconcile all those. Of those uh, uh, standpoints. So, so, I, but I think that's a good question. I, I, I'll keep it in mind and and looking into it. Um, yes. And as to your second <coughs> question, uh, the, the, uh, ec uh, about ec ecology, I think uh, 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 ecology and science. I think uh, actually, uh, uh, this year's pandemic, right? The COVID nineteen and Trump's touched response to COVID nineteen. Uh, has changed some people's view, both uh, uh, in the liberal camps and nationalist camps. So uh, but some of them changed in a more uh, peculiar, curious way. So uh, in the nationalist camp, I think uh, nowadays many uh, former pro-Trump nationalists are now no longer pro-Trump. In, in its proper sense, like maybe they they will still support Trump as a as a way to weaken U.S. But they will no longer see Trump as a worthy adversary. In fact, they 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 mock Trump openly uh, in Weibo or uh, WeChat, right? So so they mock Trump for not believing in science, for botching the pandemic response, uh, and uh, they they see Trump as a as a clown. So. So for nationalists, that is something to celebrate. And uh, <clears throat> for Chinese liberals, uh, you can see a very, uh, you can see a bifurcated uh, reaction to Trump's response to COVID-19. Some Chinese liberal intellectuals have actually kind of uh, wake up from their pre uh, previous pro-Trump slumber. And now they realize that, oh, Trump is uh, inept, Trump is corrupt, and Trump completely messed, uh, messed things up. So we cannot, in, uh, in conscience, we can no longer in conscience support Trump. And so um, as you can see, some prominent Chinese liberal intellectuals have in recent months 
publish uh, uh, op-eds criticizing Trump and criticizing their pro-Trump liberal colleagues. For example, Professor Zhang, uh, Zhang Qianfan, who is a prominent law professor in China, uh, last month published a very long article in, chi in Chinese uh, denouncing his uh, pro-Trump friends, pro-Trump liberal friends. But other Chinese liberal intellectuals have actually doubled down on Trump. Like they have, they, they, they refuse to believe that Trump has uh, watched the pandemic response. They have, they refuse to believe, believe that. They, they be, instead, they believe that this is all CCP propaganda, right? Because they, they, they uh, and uh, for example, Professor, Professor Guo Yuhua uh, have, uh, have, have been saying in recent months that Oh, the uh, COVID nineteen isn't re it is actually a hoax. It's a it's a hoax. It's a, it's a, the it's something the uh, Communist Party used to to uh, increase its control and surveillance. And Trump has been doing exactly the right thing for like um, uh, uh, to to advocate opening up schools, opening up bars. But it was uh, sabotaged by Bizwa in the U.S. But, so so you can see that. Uh, Depending on like how how strongly they invest in Chinese uh, cause, right? They, they, and how uh, strongly they 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 uh, they they how deeply they have been dragged into the liberal echo chamber in China, the WeChat echo chamber. Uh, their responses, their reactions to what's happening this year is uh, diverge diverge to, to, to the greatest possible degree. So, so uh, yes, to, to, to go back to the question you asked about ecology and science, I think yeah, it all depends on how those information is filtered through their disposition, I filter through the information they receive. Thank you. So, um, Jia Xinzang has a question on, in the chat room. So, um, so, about what about the gender composition of Chinese Trump supporters? That may be interesting to explore the dynamics between the nascent anti-intellectualism and embedded masculinity, sexual inequalities in China. Whether you have any comment on that? Uh, sorry, I, I, I think the, the uh, can you repeat the question because the signal. Oh, I see, okay. So, so Zhang is curious uh, about the gender composition of Chinese Trump supporters and would be interested in your opinion about the dynamics between the nascent anti-intellectualism and embedded masculinity, sexual inequalities in China. Uh, yeah, thanks, that, that, that's, a, that's a great point. I think uh, to begin with, I think uh, uh, nationalist and civilizational discourses always have a very strong gender components in it. Like, so uh, not only in China, but also in the West, like if you uh, look at the, the right-wing talk points, uh, the kind of uh, uh, Islam Islamophobic propaganda uh, and conspiracy theory, it, a common theme is that uh, the, the Muslim immigrants are coming, they, 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 they are using this so-called uh, warm strategy um, 子宮, 子宮戰略, uh, so the, I, I don't know if this uh, this is a term invented by Chinese uh, Chinese medicine or it came from the West, but the idea is that uh, they come carrying their worms and giving birth to as many kids as possible, so that in two decades, three decades, uh, the whole Europe will be occupied by by Muslims because uh, European whites are not giving birth and uh, Muslims are giving birth to a lot of kids. So so this is welcoming Muslims, welcoming um, refugees and immigrants is a uh, demographic suicide. That, that's the kind of uh, right-wing talk points um, which has been accepted and internalized by many uh, Chinese liberals as well as nationalists. So <clears throat> you can see that uh, actually in recent years uh, with, with the revelation of, of uh, Xinjiang concentration camps and so on forth, right? So uh, Ch Chinese nationalists and some Chinese liberals have rushed to defend concentration camps on the, on the, base, on the base that, oh, we shouldn't allow 
uh, Uyghur minorities to give birth to many kids because that's dangerous to the Han nation. Right? So, uh, and you can see that in this narrative, uh, women are, 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 are perceived as a kind of instrument for giving birth, for, for, for making the, the nation stronger and more populous through this, through their only function of birth giving, right? So, and uh, the man's function is defend the nation, is to assert masculinity, is to assert aggressiveness, right? So I believe that nationalism and civilization discourses is always gendered. And, uh, <clears throat> and to go back to the, to the, the current events in, in China, uh, because Xi Jinping himself has been quite, uh, let's say, ultra conservative uh, in terms of gender policies, sex policies, right? So in recent years, Xi Jinping has been advocating or his acolytes has been advocating uh, the kind of uh, traditional gender roles. Uh, they, the official, like I have friends who recently got married, I think got married last year in Beijing and they went to uh, the, the official uh, civil affairs offices uh, to register their marriage to get certificated, right? And when, when they received the marriage certificate, they also received an official pamphlet um, saying that uh, how to be a good wife. The way to be a good wife is to not compete with your husband, is to be submissive, and because your husband is bread earner and, uh, and uh, to compete with men increases their anxiety in workplace and which uh, undermines family harmony and societal harmony. But that's things now in official pamphlets. Right? Uh, a decade ago, you wouldn't see that because despite all those uh, all the mis misgivings, uh, grievances we have against the, uh, the authoritarian regime, the Communist Party had always present itself as a, as a left-wing party. Uh, even though how, how much that is true in reality is, is up to debate, but like in the official propaganda, they always say that, oh, we are a party for gender equality, right? But with the rise of Xi Jinping, things have been, have been changing subtly. So <clears throat> that, Again, that, that, that's, that kind of uh, rolling back of gender equality uh, and the kind of uh, increased use of gendered uh, nationalist discourses, uh, I think uh, figures prominently in, in the current public discourses in China. So to, to what extent they, this is intertwined with, uh, with the pro-Trump discourses and to what extent this uh, reinforces Trump, uh, Trumpism in China or among uh, li Chinese liberal intellectuals? I don't know, but I think that um, must be some connections there. All right, thank you. I think that uh, echoes uh, what Joyce Fan raises in the chat box about the sort of the, uh, the, the treatment of, of women in contemporary China. Uh, so, Su Hyun An. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, so yeah, thanks a lot for the uh, presentation. Um, I found it really exciting because you know I was thinking about this issue as well, but in Korean context. And there, I've seen a lot of Korean liberals, not necessarily intellectuals, but they, a lot of supporters show sympathy to Trump, surprisingly, and they say, yeah, he's you know the uh, universal health care, you know he messed it up, and you know it's bad. But immigration policy and protection protectionism is for his people, and Trump is doing good, something good for the for Americans. And um, so, and um, when you really tr trace back these arguments, you can see that you know there is ethnic nationalism, which has been the you know uh, shaping Korean liberals, you know, um, in the past, like a at least in the past, like a five years with the not five years, but four years with the new liberal president, it, that's like really playing a big role. You know, um, the Korean liberals are like, you know, they are anti-refugee, a lot of them, and they're very wary of the, you know, um, immigration and things like that. Um, and so, um, and this ethnic nationalism 
it really, when, when you see the Korean liberal politicians, how they form it, it really goes back to the colonial era and the trauma from then, you know, people have to, have to get gather together, we are Koreans and we're gonna protect ourselves. And it seemed like they are kind of like drawing a parallel, somehow like, you know, they're juxtaposing that ethnic nationalism to the American situation and justifying what, what Trump is doing. And so I found it really interesting how, how you talk about Lei Ching era and how it, you know, really continues. And so at some point I, I felt like um, to borrow um, content of philosopher Derrida's words, um, history is haunting us, you know, it's like a coming back and it's here to stay. And um, so I wonder like a, if you feel that, you know, this trend is gonna stay, even if, you know, we have like a less um, obviously anti-immigrant, like a racist president, but still who's nationalist. Do you think, you know, this is gonna continue as a trend? If like, you know, there's a, um, you know, president who's a lot milder, milder than Trump, let's say Bush kind of person, like, you know, do you think it's going to incite a similar feelings in um, Chinese liberals? And is it going to stay here? That's the main question, I guess. Oh, thank you. That, that's a great question. Uh, I only say I don't know. I, I'm not, I'm, I'm never a great predictor. Like in 2016, I didn't predict uh, predict the Trump will win. Uh, so, <laughs> I mean, uh, so, but I think that um, it depends on how things go from this point on. Like, suppose uh, uh, Trump was tr suppose Trump is defeated next week, and suppose there are uh, I, I suppose there there'll be cases about his corruption, about like all kinds of things, right? Uh, coming on. Even if he pardons himself, he can only pardon uh, his federal crimes, but not state crimes. And state prosecutors would like that, so that uh, there would be things going on. But and how those things will play out uh, would have an effect on how Chinese liberals and maybe Korean liberals uh, reflect on um, the mistakes, their misconceptions, and uh, and I also think like. It also depends on the information infrastructure in general. Like uh, a lot of uh, the, the trans, trans, transformations that we have been discussing uh, today uh, happens in a kind of uh, uh, increasingly uh, social media kind of uh, ecological system, right? The informational system. Uh, uh, the, 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 there are more and more echo chambers uh, and, and the information bubbles uh, in China, especially uh, because WeChat has been so dominating and WeChat as a kind of closed information system, you cannot fact check some article because to uh, post comments uh, uh, on, on, uh, uh, under some article, you the comment need to be approved by the author of the article, right? So. Uh, as long as the, the author doesn't approve your comments, you you it is to no avail to fact uh, check the the, the 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 articles and also the the which are group uh, functions and moment functions they are all closed and and semi private uh, which makes uh, the breaking of of echo chamber all the more difficult and adding on that is the censorship system of China so <clears throat> you can see that the Chinese liberal intellectuals. Uh, after after this great divisiveness over uh, Trump, right? They they self select their, their, their loyal friends, their, 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 those who agree with them, uh, to new WeChat groups to to to, and they sell, uh, they select who can see their WeChat moment posts and so on and so forth, right? So it's harder and harder for those loyal Trumpists to be corrected on a factual basis. So even if like the the. the the, 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 the more uh, the new moderate Republican presidents in the future after Biden, whatever, uh, the, the already mature right wing uh, or far right uh, misinformation networks are already in place. And to break the whole dialogue, not only needs like the kind of uh, philosophical, psychological analysis that are presented here, that we 
we need actual strategies to break up those echo chambers. We need uh, strategies to build new like communications and information inf infrastructure in order to have a better intellectual conversation. So I think that's the that's a big challenge ahead. You muted yourself, Tao. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, um, yes, on that note, let's um, bring this to a conclusion. So thank you so much for this um, very interesting and inspiring uh, talk presentation. And also, I want to thank everybody for raising uh, interesting questions. Uh, and this is the, the challenge um, that we're talking about is clearly very um, daunting. And, and so, so let's, let's see what happens. Um, I'm going to stop recording.